Dr. Stefan Lanker was originally trained as a virologist. Mm -hmm. So he knows all about virology. But he, he, as I often tell people, he doesn't like to be called a virologist anymore because he realizes that it's a, a faulty methodology and that it has no relevance to true science. Yeah. Um, so and he actually people may know a few years ago he in Germany, he ta uh, took to task the medical establishment and asked them to try and prove in a German court uh, whether there was a virus that caused measles. And to cut a long story short, he won his case because the medical establishment couldn't prove with the papers. There were six so-called scientific papers that they brought up. Bienvenue à ma chaîne. Dans cette vidéo, je vais faire un entretien avec Don Lester et David Parker um, à propos de leur livre « What really makes you ill? » Hi Don, hi David, thank you so much for accepting my invitation. It's hi. A, it's a pleasure, hello. It's really, really nice to talk to you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you'll be publishing um, your book in French. Do you have a title? It it will be uh, well. We're we're, le <laughs> we're leaving that with the French publisher uh, because they're going to because it's such a big book. Uh, he's decided he's going to publish it in two volumes in French. Okay. Uh, so we're really excited to see that, which should be later this year. We're hoping, um, but we're not quite sure how the title will work out in French. It should be the same, but in French. But we don't know yet until he's uh, until he's uh, finished it and then he'll give us a, a couple of copies of it to, to have a look at. So, yeah, so that's really exciting. Yeah, that's really good news. Now, before I start the interview, I really just wanted to let everyone know that this channel has a strike. I've had a number of videos that have been censored. So I think this interview, from what I've gathered, we're not talking about anything that's very, very contentious um, per se, but... Um, we're talking about theories, and so I'd like people to know that, that we're discussing theories. This is we're not um, attributing truths, um, especially the censors. They really have to understand this. So um, your book is quite an opus. Uh, the last time I, I read anything um, this massive was the Iliad back in university. <laughs> um, I'm only uh, a quarter of the way through, and um, already have so many questions, uh, really simple questions, which is the reason I contacted you. Um, and also, as I mentioned to you in my emails, this is also a personal journey for me because I am studying Chinese medicine. I've gone through a healing journey. I did. I worked as a European herbologist. And so I have all these questions about the healing and um the vision, the paradigm of health that we're in. And your book um, so far has been the most comprehensive book I've come across in terms of ideas and theories and the foundation and historical um, parts of it. So I'd really like to start from the beginning of what our um, allopathic um, system is based on, is it's the germ theory. And so can you tell me a bit about the founder of the germ theory and how he came across his theories? OK, uh, we'll keep it as brief as we can because it's quite a complex story. But really speaking, uh, the idea of germs causing disease has been around for a long time, even though the germ theory tends to be credited mostly to Louis Pasteur. Uh, he wasn't really the first person that thought that. It goes back maybe 200 years before him. So it goes back a long way when people were 
struggling with it, this idea of something causing disease. You go back far enough and people were thinking it was evil spirits or sort of very mysterious things. No one had understood why people got ill. And then a few people came up with this idea that maybe there were some tiny things that were attacking the body. And that was really the start of it. And that was probably in the 1700s. Um, but eventually, coming to more recent times and into the days of uh, Louis Pasteur and uh, Robert Koch in Germany, they were sort of the founders, really. So we're talking the sort of mid to late 1800s. Um, and uh, Robert Koch in Germany was is sort of credited as being the father of uh, bacteriology. And uh, Louis Pasteur sort of as a contemporary was they, that, that's why they seem to be credited with it. So we have the Koch Institute in Robert Koch Institute in Germany and the Louis Pasteur Institute uh, in France. Um, but we try to get people to realize that it's still called the germ theory, you know, yeah. a, th a theory being something that's not yeah. proven. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't proven in their day. Uh, and many other doctors and scientists of the time mm -hmm. uh, disagreed totally with what uh, both Koch and Pasteur were saying. Uh, they said this is an unproven thing uh, and it's still based on superstition and all sorts of things. So they, they came in for a lot of criticism in their day. Mm -hmm. um, but in Louis Pasteur's uh, credit, if you like, why, why his name has come forward and has been lionized by the medical industry is because he, he, he acquired some very influential friends, uh, not least of which was Napoleon III uh, at the time. And he got involved, uh, really, starting with uh, in France with uh, a problem with wine, French wine, with it becoming sour. And they wanted to know what was causing this. And he got invited by Napoleon to his palace. And uh, that's how it all started. So he got very influential friends. And so then whatever he said, Louis Pasteur, that is, became accepted as the truth, even though there was no scientific evidence to support what he was saying. And in later decades, modern times, it's been shown that uh, much of what Louis Pasteur said was not only not proven by science, either then or now, but a lot of it was actually fraudulent. He was actually making things up. And uh, some of the papers, his personal papers that have come out since his death, have shown that, have shown that uh, uh, he knew very well that what he was saying wasn't true. But of course, uh, He'd already got himself into in too deep, really. Uh, and it's unfortunate that even though the work of both Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur with their ideas about the germ theory and their ideas about microorganisms being the cause of most diseases, even though all of that is not proven by science, unfortunately, uh, with the growing power shall we say, of the pharmaceutical industries um, right up to present day, there's huge amounts of money invested in the fact that these small microorganisms cause disease, wow. either whether it's uh, bacteria or viruses. Although, again, as we point out to people, uh, these particles that are called viruses are not living organisms even though they get grouped together as microorganisms. But bacteria are living organisms, but viruses are not. They really, our research has shown that they're cellular debris and uh, do not meet any of the criteria for a living thing. For something to be classed in science as being a living thing, it has to be able to uh, eat and excrete, reproduce, have a certain minimum DNA. And these particles. David, um, before we get on to the subject of um, virus, um, you said something that really intrigued me because you do mention it in the book as well. Um, so the, uh, Louis Pasteur's work was not um, uh, has not been verified in his time nor to in today's age. But I, I was surprised because in the book you said that his papers were not um, 
people weren't allowed to see his paper, even to this day. But now you're saying that they're getting to see his studies. Is that is that true? There, there is a, um, I think uh, there was a book written or at the time. Um, is it Geisen? Geisen? Mm, yeah. 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 Uh, so there's, who did was quite a lot of work. 1990s, I think. Yeah. Uh, got access to some of the private papers of his diaries. Uh, yeah, his diaries and private papers, um, and examined them. And I think he's written about them. You can you can see this, uh, find this information. Um, and when Louis Pasteur's diaries and papers were examined by, I can't remember if he was a doctor. I can't remember now. This Dr. Geisen or Geisen anyway, uh, realised that the, the amount of fraud that um, Pasteur had uh, passed off on the people as being true when he, quite honestly he knew that it wasn't. I, sorry. No, I was just going to say I believe he had access to the papers. I don't think they're necessarily generally available. I think it was uh, because they kept privately. But uh, Gerald Geisen, I think of Princeton University, uh, was able to have access to them. Um, but I, I don't think they are. Um, generally available. It's just the information that his papers didn't agree with his diaries. Um, you know, it's being shown that there were some definite differences that what he said he'd done was not necessarily the same. Uh, well, in many cases, wasn't the same as what he'd actually done and what he'd proved. So uh, he, he changed some of the uh, experiments and turned them so that they looked as if they were successful when they weren't successful. Oh, my God. And, yeah. this was, and this was the first time ever since he was alive, uh, or even during his lifetime, no one had access to his um, papers. So basically in the 1990s, this was the first time they had access to what his work. Yes. His private, his private documents, yes. Uh, that's amazing. And yet... Um, in fact, uh, just to, to, to sort of say, he left instructions, Louis Pasteur left instructions that... Uh, upon his death, no one was to have access to those papers. I mean, he'd left specific diaries, instructions yeah, yeah. that no one should have access to his papers and his private papers and diaries. So that should sound a warning bell. You know, if it was genuine science, why would he want to hide all that? So um, unfortunately, fortunately, should I say, they didn't get destroyed, although some people say that he did want them destroyed. Uh, but fortunately, they weren't all destroyed. And so... Uh, people like Gerald uh, Geisen yeah. uh, did get access to them. And mm -hmm. so some of that information has now been made public and people have realised that there was quite a bit of fraud going on oh. with Pasteur said he'd done and what he'd actually done. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm aware of uh, Valérie Redot's testimonial. He wrote a book on his uh, father-in-law and he said that at the end of his life, Pasteur um, on his deathbed said, um, Béchon uh, avait raison, Antoine Béchon, regarding his theory, and that in that sense, in, in that phrase, he completely, um, you know, disqualified his own work. So it does, I mean, when you start um, connecting the dots, um, it does make you wonder. <clears throat> um, at the same time, you say in your book that the NIH um, has this it basically it structures everything around the germ theory as if it were a fact and it disseminates it in every university and every school would you like to could you talk a little bit about that because i don't think a lot of people are aware of their work sorry the nih yeah now would you like to speak on that um, well, uh, the NIH is like the WHO, the CDC um, and all the other um, uh, health organisations. Um, they all have the same um, policy to put out the same information. And um, so it, it's, it suits them to keep the germ theory alive um, because so many... Uh, careers, shall we say, are, are based on all of that, that if it's shown to be not true, uh, it takes away just about everything that they've been working on for decades, uh, you know, over a century. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it just changes everything and of course they don't want that to change they want the uh, current system to carry on um, because it suits them to keep um, uh, to keep uh, the pharmaceuticals sort of uh, you know the treatments that they say um, because if everyone realized that the germ theory has never been proven then it, it well literally it changes everything overnight yeah. so um uh we found um when we were looking at different study papers um and a lot of them are published on the website of the nih and their uh library um that uh, when certain diseases are discussed at the very beginning, uh, it says this disease is caused by or this pathogen causes this disease. You know, the the paper starts with that statement. So it's all of the papers are based on the same assumption, the same theory. So it keeps going instead of um, these study experiments looking at the possible causes of a disease. They already start with the assumption um, that is based on the uh, historical idea of this particular disease is caused by this particular pathogen. Uh -huh. Even though if you keep going back further and further and further, if you go to the origins, keep going back in time, there are no study papers that prove absolutely that any of these pathogens are the cause of any of these diseases. So they just keep perpetuating the same ideas, the same theories, but they're not based on any proven um, scientific experimentation. It's They're not scientifically proven. And, and this was quite a shock to us as well, because we, you know, we assumed that these diseases were caused by the pathogens. We, you know, that's we looked at the the kind of information that's put out by the WHO, the NIH, the CDC and all the other organisations. And it's, you know, their papers quite uh, clearly state, you know, for example, uh, tuberculosis is caused by this bacterium, you know, the, the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And it's stated. Um, but as I say, looking back, there is no definitive study paper that shows that that has been proven scientifically and of course the TB the tuberculosis is one of the um, diseases that Robert Koch is claimed to have um, been able to prove was caused by the bacterium but even though it said that he proved it uh, it's quite clear that he didn't actually prove it because you know it's that um, and it even if I could just what you don't know about Robert Koch Koch, can you maybe um, explain his postulates and how that's become kind of uh, the way of uh, studying bacteria? Um, can you do well, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I think, I mean, he's probably most famous, uh, Robert Koch, certainly in today's terms, as uh, Robert, people are always mentioning Robert Koch's postulates yeah. um, and quoting them. Uh, and really, his first postulate is the most important one, really, which states, and the most common sense one, which states that, basically, I'll paraphrase it, that uh, for any person with a particular disease, then the germ should always be found in that person yeah. and should never be found in a person who is healthy. Yeah. And you'd think, well, that's common sense. But as Dawna said, Robert Koch is attributed to having discovered the tuberculosis bacteria and yet he defies his own postulate because uh, the tuberculosis bacteria is not only found in people who are supposed to have the disease, it's found in people who are healthy wow. and, and just the opposite. So he <laughs> even though he invented the postulate, medical the medical system uh, sort of flies in the face of it all the time and uh, we found in our studies that it's not only true of tuberculosis there are other diseases too like diphtheria where people can not have the germ in their body but have supposedly the disease diphtheria and other people who do have it um, 
I don't. We, connection lost. Ah, we seem to have lost the connection. I'm saying the connection had been lost, so we, uh, not, I was having a look at it. We've been recording um, this whole time. That's okay. Um, well, in regards to that um, Cox postulate, um, he um, don't they now say? Haven't they now? Uh, slightly attuned the theory saying that it all depends on a person's terrain that you can have the microbe the bacteria but you won't get sick unless the ideal uh, circumstances are involved and I think that's also theory as you um, astutely point out in the book that's also used in natural medicine yeah well the, the thing is that if um, if a uh, passage well if a microorganism is supposed to cause a disease then if a person has that microorganism in their body and they don't have disease then that microorganism cannot be the cause um that's, you know that's it, just logic. yes yeah. um now if it depends on the terrain or the environment of the person's body then that means that there's another in fact another factor involved yeah. so you have to say well that organism is not the cause um, at which point you have to say well that means that something else is the cause yeah. and so it, you know it, it, it's if uh, other factors are brought in that makes it uh, that that changes the theory so it's any exception to a theory means that the theory needs to be looked at so that again shows that the germ theory is not proven because in so many cases the um, uh, so-called pathogens are found in people who don't have the disease that the germ is supposed to cause and so it you know if it depends on the terrain then you say well forget about the germ let's look at the terrain let's look at the other factors because they are more um, likely to be relevant to a person's health than the germ because it's not the germ. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, people, very analytical people tend to go into science and they seem passionate about their research and what they're doing. How is it possible that, you know, they're not um, seeing what you see? Well, people, people do. I mean, we obviously over the 10 years, over 10 years that we spent researching uh, the book that we wrote, um, because we started with the same ideas as everyone else. We believed everything the medical system said. We believed that the medical system was based on true science and that everything they said was provable. That's where, that's where we started. So we were deeply shocked when we realised that the medical system is not based on science at all. It's based on assumptions and dogma. Mm -hmm. um, and during our studies, we talked to a number of doctors, both then and now, and asked them about their training. You know, how a doctor could go through medical school for four or five years and come out the other end and um, still believe the germ theory when it's not been proven. And it's quite obvious once we've talked to doctors because they're, they're indoctrinated, if you like. It's just dogma. They're, they're basically told, well, this disease is caused by that bacterium or that disease is caused by that virus and this is the treatment. And it's, it's almost as simple as that. So they never get to do any research or they never get to ask the question, well, how do you know that that bacteria causes that disease or how do you know that that virus causes that they, they never get to ask those questions otherwise they don't pass their exams so it's very much an indoctrination and so you then get a group of doctors coming out of their training who've been indoctrinated to think in a certain way and they never get to question whether there is true science backing it up the other thing of course is the scientists who work in laboratories are taught and trained to um, analyze the different particles um, that they're looking at and to work with them in certain cell cultures and that their um, training teaches them to um, conduct certain experiments and that if they follow this particular experiment 
then they will find something uh, and that is the answer. And, and so they're, they're working purely in a laboratory with different bits and pieces and chemicals and stains and fixatives and looking at things under an electron microscope. Um, they're not looking at a, a living human body. Um, and so the the idea of what they're looking at in a laboratory is now so so far, far away from what happens in a living human body, because the minute you take something out of the body, um, it's it's already changed its environment. Um, and so everything is affected by its environment. So they've already changed it. By the time they put chemicals or they dry it or they stain it, it's again changed very much. Or if they're growing it in a cell culture, it's in a substance that isn't found in the body. Quite often the cell cultures are agar and those kinds of things. And But that's not part of the body. So they're looking at something in a very different way. But because it's takes place in a laboratory and it's all looks like science um, that they believe that they're conducting science wow. and so they believe what they're doing is um, is important and what they're finding and these different how everything acts and interacts in a cell culture or a petri dish they they those are their scientific experiments yeah. but it's not to do with a living human body. I mean, for instance, we've often pointed out that, as Dawn said, once you've taken something out of the body and put it in a petri dish, uh, the, the environment is so vastly different, not least of which because the human body, as well as it being a chemical system and an interactive chemical system, it's also an, it has an electrical system. Yes. Uh, it's a very subtle electrical system, but nonetheless very important. Yes. So as soon as you've put your sample in a petri dish, you've completely isolated it from the body's electrical system. So again, it bears no resemblance to how it would act in the human body. And these are the big mistakes, particularly in virology, the big mistakes that virologists make. They're not working with real things uh -huh. in a real environment. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's what we're all suffering from um, yes. with, medical, with the medical system. Yeah, and you, yet you point out in the book that um, there is a recognition that bacteria is part of our the, our human fiber. There, yes. you know, and so you can have the polio virus and not have the polio, and they're part of your microbiome. So, um, yeah, it seems like um, I, I don't know. It almost seems like there is a, a small shift happening in the scientific community in regards to bacteria and how they're viewed, but you know, hopefully we will see huge changes. Um, how important is the germ th theory in terms of virology? Well, um, sort of virology really sort of grew up from once they'd uh, invented the electron microscope, really, uh, sort of so we're looking at the 1930s onwards. Uh, because before the 1930s, they only had optical microscopes, so they could only see bacteria, uh, which are living things. Uh, they could see them in the blood, uh, although they wrongly attributed the bacteria to causing disease, purely because when they first saw them, whenever they saw dead or dying tissue in, in the blood, let's say, um, there'd be bacteria clustered around that dead and dying tissue. Mm -hmm. So they made the wrong assumption that it was the bacteria that had caused the dead and dying tissue, um, rather than realising that the bacteria was playing a vital role of cleaning up the system. And that's why there is so much bacteria. It works exactly the same way in the body as it does out in nature, where well, you see it breaking uh, things down. Sorry to cut you off, but when you refer to the dead tissue, are you talking about the RNA, RNA and DNA that's found uh, around the exome of the cell? Is that what you're referring to? No, when, um, uh, well, cells die all the time, but when um, a process happens in the body that um, uh, cells or tissues are diseased, they become damaged. And that's when they um, are dead or, or dying. And that's when the bacteria come in to, to clean up the dead and dying tissue. So it's uh, it's when something has been, um, it's, it's not diseased because it's, 
disease is not something that that you catch it's a condition within the body so if you're exposed to a uh, a toxic substance say a you know toxic chemical for example mm-hmm. that can cause damage in the body to certain cells and tissues and the damage can actually uh, cause part of the tissue to um, to die off or, or to be well so far damaged that the bacteria come in and, and uh, clean it up okay. and take it away okay um, yeah, as, as I say the same as it does in nature this is the yeah. job of bacteria to yeah. break things down and okay. clean them up okay so in terms of going back to um, viruses yeah so what exactly are they and how does this fit into this process of breaking down cells well with viruses or these things that are called viruses um, uh, something completely different altogether as I mentioned earlier these particles I prefer to call them particles because they're really cellular debris as Dawn mentioned when a cell dies which happens hundreds of thousands of times every day is part of normal uh, life and when these cells break down they break up into little bits and pieces um, I often refer to it as imagining breaking a, dropping a small pane of glass onto the floor and it breaks up into a dozen pieces, mm-hmm. uh, different shapes and sizes, um, and a cell could be the same. But what happens is that uh, the relatively new methodology of virology comes along and they look at all those little bits and pieces of the broken cell and start attributing names and purposes to the individual bits and pieces but without any proof and this is really what virology has become it it's a it's a very flawed methodology and um, whenever you and we have and many others have looked for any scientific papers to show that uh, where a virologist has taken one of these broken pieces of a cell and said that this is a pathogen and it causes such and such a disease uh, we've looked for any scientific paper to prove that and they, they they're nowhere to be found they do not exist and this is for any uh, virological disease so-called that you can think of uh, and we've looked when you say they don't exist, do you mean uh, a virus has not been extracted uh, in its entirety is that what you're saying um is never been isolated, properly isolated, nor fully categorized for its uh, genetic makeup, or ever been proven to cause a disease. Because the sort of methodology that should be used, should be used, um, should be to first of all isolate the particle so that it, it is only that and nothing else. Mm-hmm. Isolate the particle then categorize it to see what its genetic makeup is and then it should be introduced into a living creature or preferably a human being Mm -hmm. and that human being should then exhibit the disease. So we're going back to Cook's postulate. Exactly and that's never been done which is which surprised us when we first came across it. It's never been done for any virus and yet all of these claims are made about what viruses do yeah. uh, and yet science admits that they're not living so right. that's the first problem and secondly they've never done that course of action which is in Cox postulates yeah. they've never carried them out so that's why we say it's totally unscientific to blame these cellular particles as being the cause of anything it's oh. never proven which brings me to you talk about it in the book. It was quite an eye-opening about uh, Dr. Stefan Lanka. Well, yeah. Would you tell us a bit about him? Sure. Uh, well, fortunately, uh, I mean, we've become friends with Stefan Lanka and we have yeah. talk, talked to him a few times and we're, <laughs> we have a project going at the moment to try and bring <laughs> more of his information forward. But uh, yes, very, very interesting man. And... Uh, we came across him oh, about 2013, 2012, something like that. So we've known of his work for a long time. And of course, Dr. Stefan Lanker was originally trained as a virologist. Mm-hmm. So he knows all about virology. 
but he, he as I often tell people he doesn't like to be called a virologist anymore because he realizes that it's a, a faulty methodology and that it has no relevance to true science yeah. um, so and he actually people may know a few years ago he in Germany he ta uh, took to task the medical establishment and asked them to try and prove in a German court uh, whether there was a virus that caused measles and cut a long story short he won his case because the medical establishment couldn't prove with the papers there were six so-called scientific papers that they bought up uh, the oldest one was uh, the Anderson Peebles paper of 1954 which it, on which all virology is based and uh, we've read that paper and as Stefan Lanker pointed out that it doesn't prove anything even Enders and Peebles, the people who wrote the paper, admit it doesn't prove that a virus causes measles. Um, yes. And so, as I say, cut a long story short, he won the case. The medical establishment couldn't prove that a virus causes measles, and yet they carry on vaccinating people <laughs> against measles. So it, it's <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess you know, when I read that, I actually went online. I was not able to find a shred of an article, either in English or in French. I did, however, um, I went on Facebook and I, I tried to contact him I, um, through different means because he's, he's um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he's a professor at a German university, um, or he was a professor at a German university. But in any event, I, I was on Facebook and somebody started a page in honor of his work and he's a doctorate in virology and uh, he I, I was really surprised um, that he was studying virology getting his PhD in virology and yet he was holding up um, Dr. Latka as a you know as a hero basically we had a small exchange so um how you know this uh, this man um, Stefan Lanka, there's no, I don't see anything online about this court case. So, what? Uh, it, well, there's probably a very good reason for that. That uh, um, <laughs> you might find, uh, well, there were actually two parts to the court case. The first part, where um, a doctor in Germany claimed the prize, it was a hundred thousand euro um, prize for somebody proving that measles, uh, measles was caused by a virus. And um, <clears throat> in that first case, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, Dr. Lanker oh. was claimed to have um, claimed to have lost the case. And you may well find um, articles about that um, because, you know, that obviously no, not even that. OK, because it's possible to find a, a few yeah. where they're saying, oh, he lost the case. You know, he was proven wrong you know, ha ha. Um, but there was a um, an appeal that went to the German Supreme Court that overturned the original um, decision because those six papers were studied by expert witnesses and they were quite uh, clear that the those papers did not provide the proof that measles was caused by a virus. Um, but of course, there's very little, uh, even in English, where, you, you know, to find those um, uh, articles about that particular decision. Um, it's only because we uh, have had um, contact with various people that we know how to look for some of these articles, but it is getting more and more difficult to find the information. And we uh, we know the reason. <laughs> yeah, every gets corrupt. It's really scandalous. Um, yes. I mean, this video already I'm thinking red flag so it'll definitely be on bit shoot but I'll I'll take my chances on on my YouTube channel but um I really think your book for anyone who's interested in understanding things but what I like is you point out um uh the evidence but you don't state you, you, do, you don't have a truth like I can't figure out you know you state the problems but I don't know what your theory do you have any ideas about what's going on in terms of disease? Like why, why are we, you know? Yes, def most definitely. And in the book, you'll see that uh, because as, as well as us finding out 
that germs don't cause disease, we obviously wanted to find out what did cause, well, we call it illness. Because whenever you speak of disease, people think it's something that infects you, you know, that it's something from outside the body that it that makes the body ill. So we'd rather talk about illness because what we found and we call it our four factors, which you'll see in the book. Um, and what we found that any illness that we examined uh, and this was going back in history or anything, all the main ones that we came across, both in animals and humans, we wanted to see if it was true for animals too. And we found these four factors were always either one or a mix of them. And those four factors are uh, toxicity. So if various toxins enter the body, um, lack of correct nutrition, um, electromagnetic frequencies, so electrical interference, uh, interfering with the body's electrical system and prolonged excessive emotional stress. Uh, and those four factors we found were at the root cause of all illness, okay. either one or more of those four factors, and which but was quite usually, a, usually more than one. Usually more than one of them, but it was always one or more of those four factors, and uh, which was quite astonishing. Uh, but that's what we found, and we tried it, that theory of ours to see if it was true time and time again, and we looked back at back in history. Uh, over the last 150 years and we sort of I think quite well known for the fact that we even looked at the Black Death so going back hundreds of years to see what was the true cause of that and very very different uh, reasons came up uh, a lot of research. I look forward to reading it and you know before we end the interview um, usually people ask this at the very beginning of the interview but I decided to ask it at the end because I don't want people to have uh, to be uh, to have a, an idea as they're listening to you because one thing I have to say about this book, um, I was very impressed with the research and the way the simplicity and yet sophistication of conveying um, what you found. And so you mentioned it took you ten years to uh, gather the information. Can you, neither of you are part of the scientific community. Can you tell us a bit about your backgrounds and what prompted you um, to tackle this? Sure. Well, um, I suppose in a way, I mean, my uh, qualifications and experiences as a, an electrical engineer, and as people know us, uh, and Dawn is an accountant, um, yes. or was an accountant, <laughs> we both retired from that now. We <laughs> we spend our time uh, with research on on this um, so we d we do both come from technical backgrounds and we're used to doing research in our own fields and we're used to paying attention to detail which are the prerequisites really for any research um, so uh, but the the thing that was an advantage to us is that we had no preconceived ideas we had no blinkers on that said, oh, you can't ask that question or you can't go there, which doctors do have. They're not allowed to ask certain questions, otherwise they lose their job. And many have, uh, some of whom we know and talk to. Um, so they're not allowed to do it. But we, we had no allegiances, so we could ask any question we wanted and we could go as deep into things as we wanted. Um, and so that was a great advantage. But how we got into it just briefly was um, writing another book. Uh, we've written two other books under a, our pen name, uh, NOR. We used to write under a pen name called NOR. And it was when we were writing our first book, which is about the nature of reality, which is what NOR stands for. Um, and we were trying to f find out about life. Mm -hmm. And we had to find out about health, obviously, as part of life. And we had to find out about viruses. And up until that point, we believe the same as everyone else, you know, that viruses and bacteria caused illness. That's what we believed. Um, but once we started our research, we realized more and more that uh, that was not true. It was not supported by scientific evidence. And we looked very deeply because we were so shocked that the science wasn't there. Um, and hence why it took us 10 years, because we wanted to delve into every nook and cranny uh, to make sure that what we were finding was correct because it was so shocking because we realized it overturned everything 
everyone knew or thought about health. Um, so that's why we spent so long looking at it and talking to lots of doctors around the world. Um, but that's how we got started, purely by chance. It wasn't what we set out to do, but we realised it was so important. We had to spend the time and the research because it affects everyone, everyone in the world. Absolutely. Uh, Actually, uh, with the craziness that's happening on the planet. Um, absolutely. I really hope that the next time we'll be able to discuss Maxime in more detail because I'm just now tackling that chapter. Um, I hear that in the UK you don't have to wear masks on the streets. Is that true? You don't have to, although many people do. I mean, we never do, but uh, we don't wear one anywhere because we know there's no point to it. <laughs> well, we're mandated uh, here uh, since August 1st. And if you don't, it's a 135 euro fine. I have, I know people who've been fined. Mm. And so even those who contest the madness, um, that there's a financial reason for um, yeah. doing so. It's been extremely um, frustrating, but I really envy the fact that um, you still have a choice whether you want to wear one or not. And I think that's very important. So, um, I really wanted to thank you again for your time, and um, I, yeah, and so I really hope mm -hmm. that this um, interview sheds light on the subject, and um, so that we can keep discussing theories and ideas because that's what this interview is about. When there, you, you're not stating facts, you're just pointing things out. So, anyway, um, Don and David, thank you again. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.